I guess I guess what's so shocking is how thin our memories are culturally. My name is Ben Charland. You're listening to What on Earth is Going On. My guest this week is Rosemary Sullivan, acclaimed Canadian poet and biographer. Some of the people she's written about in the past include Elizabeth Smart, Gwendolyn McEwen, and Margaret Atwood. Most recently, in 2015, she wrote about Stalin's daughter, and it's actually about that book that we spend a lot of our time in this conversation talking about, the process of writing that book, what she had to do, her visits to Russia, in order to get the information necessary to write that book, and it's actually a really interesting story. Now, coming up in this conversation, we also talk about the concept of memory in biography and why that's so important. We also, given the fact that this was recorded in late January of 2020, talk about the impending coronavirus pandemic, and some of the things that Rosemary says are quite prescient about COVID-19. We talk about climate change, and how climate change is intangible while a pandemic may actually be tangible and may be easier to deal with. We talk about the desire to understand the creative process itself, and why one of the first things you do when you're writing a biography is contact the CIA and FBI. Now, this is a wonderful conversation, and I hope you take the time not just to listen to it, but to let me know what you think about it. Send me an email or go to social media and send me a message there. Let me know what you think of this episode or any other, who you think we should have on the podcast in the future, and what you think we should be talking about. Finally, at the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca, you can find all the show notes for this episode. There are quite a few references that Rosemary and I give, and all of them are listed out at that website. And while you're at it, if you could do me a favor, give the show a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast provider that you use. And as always, let me know what on earth you think is going on. Rosemary Sullivan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be with you and a real privilege, actually. I've been um, I've been reading your work for some time and you've had a, a, a big impact uh, on writing and on biography, uh, but also on the concept of memory mm. and how we use memory in storytelling. And um, I'm really fascinated by, by your work and I'm really, really excited to chat with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot I want to dig into, but of course, we've got the first question that we start with and you can take this anywhere you like, Rosemary. So... I'm just going to throw it at you. What on earth is going on? <laughs> One twenty twenty. I mean, you turn on the TV and it's surreal. The idea that we have a um, uh, celebrity president who uh, is um, feels he's the greatest on uh, president since the beginning of presidents. That he uh, it has the art of the deal under control, so he sends his son-in-law to negotiate with the Palestinians. It's so profoundly insulting, hurtful, indifferent, racist, everything else. And then, you know, we're dealing with, we're on the edge of a pandemic, (laughs) not quite there yet. And maybe by the time uh, your listeners are uh, listening, it'll hopefully be all over or they'll have a cure. But it's... um, it's an apocalyptic time. I mean, I'm I'm uh, now 72, and so I uh, went through the 60s. I was a high school kid uh, when you had to hide under your desk because of uh, the atomic bomb going off. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I remember I went to did an MA at the University of Connecticut, and it was the first university in the states to call the soldiers onto the campus. Wow. So uh, you know, but it didn't feel like this. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what's what's different? Why is this different now? I think it's because of climate change. I think it's because it feels apocalyptic. It feels like we have so violated the earth that we're paying for it. Uh, and, uh, so, or, you know, maybe maybe we're in a uh, sci-fi world where we bec- we'll become cyborgs. And uh, so it's the... The Armageddon feeling of it. Um, what is it, hundreds of millions of locusts in Kenya? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's biblical. Thank God I don't believe in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I read the Bible as literature, let's say. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Um, no, I, I actually agree with that. I think when you read it as literature, it opens up a lot of possibilities that are closed when you see it as dogma or as just a text for religion. Um, you know, as Christopher Hitchens, uh, the famous atheist, said, uh, religion was our first attempt 
and, a, <laughs> and the Bible, at first attempt at philosophy, first attempt at epistemology, first attempt at writing a sort of understanding of who we are and how we fit into things. And the Bible is a, is a great document for that and should be viewed as such. And um, anyways, that's, that's definitely a tangent to what we're talking about. But um, I, was in, I was talking to, on this podcast, um, a political scientist named Jonathan Rose, who said that climate change for him is the defining political question. Uh, it's the defining economic question as well. Because no other question can't be related to it. doesn't matter where you stand on the issue. It doesn't even matter if you deny climate change. It is now the central question. And that is a victory for those who have been talking about climate change for some time, who have said, this has to be the main thing we grapple with, or it will be our undoing. Uh, that, that's, that's true, uh, I suppose. Um, I've spent um, a fair amount of years uh, when I was writing Villa Air Bell, which was such a pleasure to write, um, subtitle. Uh, I think it was Marty Jackson who said the nonfiction writers, we always deal with the tyranny of the colon. <laughs> 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 Subtitle, uh, World War II Escape in a House in Marseille. Um, when I was uh, researching that, I dealt with the whole issue of propaganda and lies. And um, the idea that there's no way to control... I mean, Goebbels' theory was that you create a lie, it's outrageous, but you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and people believe it. Uh, and and so while I do believe if there's a triumph in making climate change such a central issue, I can't believe that it can be denied the way it is. Right. So that you've got Australia, the, the Prime Minister of Australia, uh, saying that um, it's the uh, climatologists, the activists who've set the fires that it, they should have cleared the underbrush or whatever. Uh, why is there this attachment? I guess It's not just an attachment to the oil industry. I guess it's an attachment to money and privilege that you can't give up easily. Well, and I think because it's become this central question, one of the answers has been the only way to solve this problem is to give up some of the things in the Western world that we become attached to, whether it's an SUV or just the convenience of daily life. Um, and the thought of giving this up causes an emotional reaction, and that sometimes leads to, well, I just either pretend it's not happening or deny that it could be happening. Um, and I think that uh, it's obviously unhelpful. Um, but the other, other thing that's happening, too, for me, anyways, is that there's a, there's a debilitating nature to this debate. It seems overwhelming and impossible to solve. Um, of course, if the first step is to acknowledge we have a problem, we seem incapable of taking step number two. Um, but it's also, you mentioned that word apocalyptic, and I certainly feel that that's an attitude that we have. Um, I was in an art gallery once some years ago, which showed late 18th century French painting, mm -hmm. which was all apocalyptic in nature, big volcanoes going <laughs> off and the underworld coming out through the ground. Um, and of course, that was the time of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. I think the art that we see today, whether it's reflected in popular forms like television or films, and the literature that's being written reflects a similar anxiety, mm -hmm. that are we coming to some kind of cliff edge? And I don't know if we have an answer to that, but it's certainly a question that artists and scholars are proposing at the same time. Well, uh, as you say, in the, in the uh, 18th century, the 19th century, it was a kind of literary um, uh, trope uh, now, with scientific evidence and uh, overpopulation and so on, it's, it seems to be so much more real. Yeah. And I think it affects, because it's so real, it affects everything and every moment of our lives, whether we're buying a chocolate bar at the grocery store or, or writing a book. And I try, yeah. In fact, it does undermine some of your passionate commitment to what you're doing. Every once in a while when I'm, I'm working on a new book, I'm sitting there and thinking, Really? <laughs> you know? What do you mean? Well, um, is there a future f f for readers? Is there, you know, um, sometimes working here in this l lovely room, you know, I get a little morose and think, oh, my God, you know, what, what, uh, what, uh, what's going to happen now? Because I, I think you're right. The one thing I can't imagine giving up is flying. And yet right. I should. Yeah. Know? but I'm going to fly to Chicago for this inauguration of a new prize for women writers. Uh, I'm going to fly to Amsterdam because I'm doing some research there. And so then I, in a kind of act of bad faith, I say, well, flying isn't the big one. The big one is to stop 
the oil industry. And then I think, well, yeah, but how do I heat my house? <laughs> you know? Right. So it really, it's a very hard uh, um, dilemma to figure out how to get to the point where you'll accept change. Now, I think there might be a positive side to the coronavirus because the coronavirus is democratic. Hmm. It doesn't, I mean, maybe some people with real wealth will be able to hide, I don't know. But um, we are all in the same boat. You know, we can't look over there and think of the, you know, when I, whenever, every, every time I, look at the um, the television on Syria, and I think of the children under those bombs and stuff like that, but it's another world. Right. The coronavirus is not going to um, participate in boundary wars. It's it's just, you know, if it does come. Well, and like, like climate change is like that too. We're yeah. all going to have to face the effects of this. And the rich people, Naomi Klein, the author once said that in the face of, you know, climate disaster, rich people can build global green zones to hide away in, but it still will affect them and it will affect all of us. And a, and a disease, a pandemic like the coronavirus um, is, is similar, but it's also tangible. Mm-hmm. Climate change is difficult for most people to understand, and it's also far away. The, the true effects of climate change, gl- man-made climate change, could be 50 years, well, are 50 years away. They may be present as well, but they're accelerating in the future. It's hard for anyone including people who do this science, to really imagine what that's going to be like. A disease that could hit you tomorrow is very tangible and something to be afraid of, and we take action. Mm -hmm. We didn't just take step one with these pandemics. We're Mm -hmm. taking steps two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, a lot of people have argued there must be a way to do the same thing with climate change, to make it tangible. Absolutely, and when you think about it, you know, we have... um, January, end of January, we have just two cases in Toronto, but one of them is self-isolating, which when I think, I'm so impressed by that. Hmm. You know, you you know you've been to Wuhan, you, you are um, dangerous to other people, so you isolate. So does somebody come and leave your food at the door? I mean, how does, how does self-isolation work? And so it demands a kind of responsibility on, on the part of all of us, and it looks like people are going to be willing to 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 extend that so maybe you know it's we're we're just beginning this apocalyptic feeling about climate change so maybe really in the next 10 years we will be able to do something about it it would be amazing if we could so you say that it affects like you know when you're sitting in this room you, you can become morose sometimes because of thinking of a potential reader um, does it affect the things that you write about as well or are you are the things that you write about are you sticking to what kind of tickles your fancy as before? Um, usually the books I write are books that come to me. I don't pick them. Hmm. Uh, there's an accident that happens. Uh, for instance, with the very first biography I wrote, uh, and I was a poet at that point. I didn't really read biography. And yet Penguin, an editor at Penguin Books, uh, approached me, having know- knowing that I had known Elizabeth Smart, and said, would you like to write a biography about Elizabeth Smart? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, well, we'll pay 5000 I said, could you make it seven? She said, no. I said, five is good. <laughs> <laughs> and then I began the process of just reading madly. I remember reading Richard Ellman's book on Oscar Wilde, which was so such a beautiful book. I learned from him because when in reading his book, you could feel and see Oscar Wilde sitting his, at his desk writing. And I understood the textured nature you need uh, in your writing, if you're going to write biography, um, I'm actually at the moment going to um, in in the spring. I'm going to be um, a, a mentor for the Rising Star program with the Writers Trust, uh, and so I've taken about 25 young, middle-aged writers, uh, reading their material, and amazingly, I find they're writing about two major subjects, either either climate. One is a remarkable uh, writer who lives in Indonesia, Canadian, and uh, she wants to write about um, the devastation that um, that planting palm olive uh, trees um, creates. And her two other essays, one was about this woman in Din- Indonesia who was a wonderful um, anthropologist and turns out to be uh, Barack Obama's mom. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then another one was about... Um, uh, orangutans, and 
well, since we're having a conversation, I'll take a tangent. Uh, sure. Orangutans apparently have 98% of our DNA. Mm-hmm. The um, um, apes and chimpanzees and so on have 99%. So uh, orangutans represent the turning point. And we we followed or led, who knows, the, the, um, the chimps and, and company in a tangent towards violence and aggression and battling, whereas the orangutans are completely peaceful species. As she puts it, they don't even have slaves. <laughs> <laughs> and she says at one point, when she gets really, really, really mad and wants to bang her head against the wall, she thinks... What would an orangutan do? And then she starts to think of of rolling through the the jungle yeah, and yeah. You know. uh, so, so wonderful pieces about um, injustice, uh, native uh, Aboriginal um, injustice in Canada, or or uh, the failure to deal with uh, these legacies of the past, so that the uh, price of I'm going to stop there. <laughs> no, no, it's it's. It, I mean, you're bringing up a lot of things, and there's there's a couple questions I had about that actually. One is this idea of injustice. A lot of writing, a lot of writing has always been about injustice, but right now it seems like that's one of the big issues that we're tackling with, it, whether it's economic injustice or um, forms of social injustice that have haunted us from the past and still continue today, whether it's racial or or sexist. And some people have tried to connect that with the climate issue which we've been talking about so far, that that climate is actually an issue of justice um, because there are nations who will bear the brunt of the effects of climate change but caused almost none of the emissions to to lead us where we are. Um, Do you think that that's a fair way to put it or are they separate issues? Is one more scientific and the other one is more moral? Um, No, I think it's a fair way to put it. Uh, whether it's um, helpful or will be um, a catalyst for action is another matter. I mean, to me, I think that, of course, the injustice of uh, of um, countries that haven't industrialized and therefore polluted in the way we've polluted is a huge issue. Uh, in fact, um, it ties in with the whole immigration issue. When people ask me about you know, um, immigration from North Africa to Europe, immigration to Canada, what are our responsibilities? I say, well, we're just turning the tables because the 19th century and the 18th century was sheer exploitation of Africa. Uh, There's a wonderful piece in the New Yorker, uh, January, uh, end of January issue, about the history of slavery uh, in the Caribbean. And my gosh, you you have no idea how horrendous. I mean, you, you have this idea of, of slavery that comes from, um, you know, uh, certain films and uh, so on, but uh, like an American-centric view. Yeah, of, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but the Caribbean slavery was just astonishing as well. So there's that. But I guess maybe it's a, well, I won't say it's sentimental. I think the deep injustice is to other species uh, that we have. Uh, if we have exhausted the climate. Uh, and and devastated the globe with um you know deforestation in the name of of um, industrialization and so on um we've 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 wiped out an astonishing number of creatures who uh you know if if a billion people die a billion <laughs> creatures die in uh, in Australia and i th- can't see how the australian fires aren't a consequence of tr- of climate change my husband is currently in Chile right now, and um, he uh, wanted to go to Chile to send up, set up a, a sound uh, engineering program. Uh, and uh, when I was down there at Christmas, I mean, you're driving along, and the desiccation of the forest is just shocking. Uh, and two years ago, half of Chile was on fire. It hasn't happened so far. But there's great questions about... Um, uh, whether there'll be enough water for the population in Santiago. While I was there at Christmas <coughs> Christmas Day, there was a uh, a fire, and it seemed to be arson, set in the city of Valparaiso. And you think, that's another thing, <laughs> that as, as resources get smaller and smaller and uh, so on, uh, there'll be a kind of cynicism that will develop in people that we'll have to really try to fight against. You know, we're, we're talking about this apocalyptic series of events, right? <laughs> um, and I'm talking to somebody whose profession has been to dig into the past and tell stories about 
and, 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 and not just dig in, but really do your research. I mean, the, the amount of material that you've had to go through to talk about Stalin's daughter, for example. Um, and, you know, dealing with memory and the power of memory and, and what different kinds of memory there are, whether it's written down or actually spoken about in an interview. Um, and I wonder if, you know, if we dig into that, if there's an analog at all to what we're facing now. I, you know, I mentioned earlier this idea of a French painting at the end of the 18th century. I think that was in a museum or a gallery in London, actually. Um, I don't know if that's an analog. I just think that it's an interesting similarity. Mm -hmm. But is there, I mean, have we ever been in anything like this situation before? Or is this truly unprecedented and fresh? You know, um, you're asking me um, as somebody who hasn't the scientific training for this, but I do think it's, it's fresh. Uh, though, again... Um, the disintegration of political institutions is interesting, and that certainly has happened before. I mean, one thinks right. of the 30s, the Depression, and, you know, um, I, guess, I guess what's so shocking is how thin our memories are culturally. Um, so that, you know, now it feels like, oh, my God, it's nothing like this has ever happened before, but we don't remember that 90 years ago, you know, men were, uh, and probably women, were riding trains... Uh, the outside of trains to get from one place to the another were um, in dust bowls uh, where there could be no planting. There were um, starvation and so on. I mean, it was an astonishingly terrible period. And luckily, uh, w you know, there was a political solution to it. So, you know, maybe if we get rid of the current president in the United States, whose name I don't like to use because I think he gets too much attention. Mm -hmm. but well, and that's what he wants, I <laughs> yeah. think. That's, that's his whole aim is to get his name on the front of every uh, posting. It's just astonishing, actually. But uh, there was a very interesting interview with Howard, Howard Stern, the, the comedian, yeah. who considered himself a pal of, uh, of Trump. Okay. And uh, before Trump uh, um, ran for president... Um, he was talking with, with Howard Stern, and the suggestion was, well, I, I get a lot of publicity. No idea that he'd ever get the position, but he'd get a lot of publicity. And so he went for it, and he won. But, I mean, the, the other thing that's behind Trump is the Christian fundamentalist ethic that is so powerful right now. But And that goes to your previous point about having a thin memory, or just a thin... Uh, morality or belief system. I mean, it's it's very interesting, and I've, it's been mentioned on the podcast before, that an evangelist, a Christian fundamentalist, could see anything to like in a man who is clearly not Christian, clearly doesn't know anything about it or care much about it, um, does lip service to it, but I think for a lot of them promises and has delivered on the promise to um, overturn abortion laws. I, um, I think that's one of the key issues at play there. It's exactly the key issue. And I really don't understand um, why it should be such a key issue. Uh, the right to life, you know, and uh, because once the child is born in a um, disorganized, you know, or single mother or something like that, perhaps put up for adoption, they don't give a darn about nurturing that life. It's an ideological position, and I, 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 I can't find an answer to why it's so important to them, because it is the one issue that is uh, uniting them. There's an incredibly interesting documentary on um, Netflix called The Family, and it's about five or six episodes, uh, and it's um, about the the Christian fundamentalist movement internationally and, and its, its momentum behind... Um, politicians throughout the globe, uh, and it focuses on their invention of this thing called the uh, White House Breakfast, you know, that everybody, including Obama, etc., cetera, has, uh, has addressed, but that it is a propaganda vehicle. Anyway, you were asking me about memory and writing biography. Um, it started, I suppose, as a desire to write and understand the creative process itself, my passion for biography. Uh, and then I discovered that um, you could create, if you had the narrative drive, and, you know, I've only written about really interesting people. <laughs> That's true, yeah. I mean, Stalin's daughter, for example, to go back to that one, like, what an, I mean, yeah, you've got gold already. Yeah. That's right. And uh, so I, I wrote about Elizabeth Smart and about Gwendolyn McHugh, and both of whom I've known, both of whom I admire deeply as writers. 
And uh, then I was getting these letters about being attached to self-destructive, dark uh, uh, women, and I, which is not in any way how I viewed the two of them. So I decided to write about Margaret Atwood, who was able to be a mother, a wife, uh, a writer, pull it off, and how did she do it, and what was the foundational um, impulse that gave her that kind of confidence as a uh, as a young woman. And certainly it had a lot to do with her family and those treks into the woods and the kind of authority it, it must have given her. And then I decided I wanted to do um, a, a, an international subject. So that's how I was sitting there watching a biography flick, bad flick, movie about Varian Fry called Varian's War. Really bad film, movie. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. Uh, and then I thought, you know, what's really, really interesting there is that... Uh, these artists gather at a villa, and at the villa, they have to decide how they're going to face fascism. And I, I think that probably in the end, what really motivates me in my writing is the issue of power. I'm, I'm fascinated by, because I, I'm not interested in having power. I'm interested in examining how I'm on the receiving end of power, as we all are. So, you know, Elizabeth Smart saying she could talk to male writers one-on-one, -on -one, but she'd never had a space at the table. Or she had the maestro of the masculine sitting on her shoulder, saying she could never be good enough. Um, I didn't have those dilemmas about self-confidence. When I was a kid, I, I have come back to this little memory more and more um, recently. When I was about eight years old, I lived on... Um, my father was a veteran from the war, though he'd spent his war as a cop in Canada, <laughs> much to his annoyance. Mm -hmm. um, we lived in a complex that was all veterans, because you could get two things out of the government when the war was over, either a house or a, a university education. So he picked the house. Uh, so there were these funny little houses. Afterwards, I'd realized that, in fact, probably a lot of these guys were suffering from PTSD, right? Yeah. But here, I, here, the bottom of the street was a woods. And so at 8 o'clock at night, just as the sun was going down, it was getting dark. I'd go alone into the woods, and I had to run all the way through the woods to this particular tree. I'd touch the tree, circle it, and come running back, chased by this phantom train. Mm. And I thought what I was doing was running into the fear. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in a way, that's... You know, when when I was 30, I took a trip to the Soviet Union in 1979 on my own, and then I went to Czechoslovakia on my own. I'm, I'm not saying that there's anything incredibly brave about that. I'm just saying that I've always had to challenge myself doing something. Well, certainly not everybody would have done that, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, like, to, to put it one way, um, there's a certain bravery, but there's also a certain power to that. I mean... And curiosity. And right. curiosity. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I've always said that I think as a Canadian, I think Canadians are different. We're chameleons. We, are don't, we don't carry an ideology on our shoulder. We don't have to impose our views on the place we visit. We are, take on the coloration of the place we visit uh, uh, to see what's there. Hmm. Uh, that's not an absolute. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, nasty imperialist-style Canadians traveling, <laughs> but... We don't have to carry the weight that an American does who has to begin always by saying they're the greatest. Right, right. You know, when I was in, in teaching in France for a year at the University of Dijon, this young couple who loved France, I mean, the wine, the food, the, but they thought that France would be so much better if it had the American system of education. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it might ruin the, it might ruin the cuisine. <laughs> Well, and, you, and and you, well, and not to make it too philosophical, but you a culture is not a, a collection of parts, right? Like you can't just replace one and put in another. It's not like a car; it's a it's a combination. It, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Obviously, nicely put. Nicely put. Uh, it is a very strange aspect, though, of um, American culture. This need to this need for exceptionalism. Right, and that's a that's a, a an overt part of the culture. American exceptionalism is something that they're openly talking about, defending and keeping. And usually, it's uh, the uh, flip side of exceptionalism is a real insecurity complex. Maybe they know the culture is pretty darn thin. Yeah. <laughs>
One thing that Rosemary said earlier in this conversation that stuck with me is that she's motivated as a writer by power, seeking out power and what defines power, where power comes from. In the conversation coming up, she answers that question. Not only why she looks for that, but where to find it. That's all coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. I had done my um, book, Villa Herbel, with a wonderful editor in New York, uh, Claire Wachtel. And uh, when I read the obituary of Svetlana in the New York Times, I went to see what was up, uh, you know, what was on Google. (laughs) And nobody had written a biography of her. And I thought... Wow, that's an oversight. So I phoned um, uh, Claire, and she said two words, Stalin's daughter, you have 10 days to write the um, synopsis. Wow. The, the proposal. Yeah, I mean, you, because if you don't write it that fast, somebody else is going to come up with the idea, with the obituary being so new. Uh, and um, I hadn't read... Uh, in years, I mean, maybe when I was 20, I read uh, 20 Letters to a Friend, her her book that's really good. Uh, but I did have a feel for it because I was in the Soviet Union in 1979 uh, under the Brezhnev regime of, you know, when people, when it was very dangerous for you to talk to people, not for your sake, but for theirs. Yeah. So um, I decided, uh, okay, the first thing you do when you're writing biography is you find out who holds the um, rights, the literary rights to letters, documents, whatever. So I wrote to um, Chris, uh, Svetlana's daughter, who lives in the States, and I said uh, who I was. I'm interested in writing a biography about your mother. I sent her my book, Labyrinth of Desire, because I thought she'd probably be funky. Mm. And I sent <laughs> I sent her um, the Elizabeth Smart book. In mean meantime... I got a um, an email, and uh, it was from her, and she said, I have heard you are going to write a biography about my mother. Cease and desist, or I will get my lawyers onto you. What? Wow. <laughs> so I thought, that's the end of that idea. And then I got another letter from her saying she'd got my letter. Our letters had crossed. Okay. And she'd like to see me. <laughs> so, uh, So I flew to meet her. And she had come with a young friend, uh, young, I mean, in his 30s, I guess, uh, and uh, as a kind of protective device. <laughs> and we sat there and we just talked. We talked about Labyrinth of Desire and relationships and this and that. And and she said, I'll let you write the book. So then the next day, I went around to her her apart, her apart uh, house. She lived with, I think, two other uh, women in this, and a man, I think, in this uh, very beautifully decorated uh, house full of art. And uh, I interviewed her. We talked about the time she'd spent in the Soviet Union and then in Georgia and what it was like and so on. And then we walked back to my motel. And uh, I can still see her sitting in the couch like the one in front of you. And uh, it's the um, light is decreasing in the window behind her. And she said, you know... Um, there were always moments when my mother would dissolve into the heartbreak of a child and there was nothing you could do to console her. Wow. And I thought, that that moment um, stayed with me and became the, the knell underneath the story that I would always return to. That uh, while there was this incredibly strong woman, willful, capable, extreme anger. Underneath, there was a vulnerability that was astonishing that came from the fact that her mother committed suicide when when Svetlana was six and a half, that her father was this terrifyingly authoritarian figure who loved her deeply. Uh, And then there was a second thing which uh, framed my vision of her. And I think, you know, I I say that poets make good biographers because poems are in vertical time. Hmm. And... Uh, biographies have to be, there have to be moments of gestalt moments where there's a sudden illumination, where you get the person. And I have to say that the one thing that makes you feel you, you, you've come as close as possible with, with words is when the subject's relative, in this case, Svetlana's daughter, said, I liked your book, you were on my mother's side. 
Right. Now, she wasn't allowed to read the book before it came out, right? Okay. Because she has to sign. you got to get her to sign a document when she doesn't know who you are, which says that uh, she gives you rights to quote from published and unpublished works. Uh, but in any case, the second thing that moved me or that I held in my mind was this image of Svetlana uh, falling in love with an Indian um an, an, an Indian man who was uh, quite a bit older than she. She often fell, fell in love with kind of these father figures. But he seemed to be, Brajef Singh, he seemed to be a very nice man. And he, But he was ill. He was uh, an Indian communist who, who was living in the Soviet Union um, for health reasons. Uh, and he was obviously also an anti-communist communist. communist. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, As with so many. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she uh, asked to marry him. She needed permission, and uh, the uh, regime said, no, Stalin's daughter is not going to marry an Indian. And then he died, and she asked to take his ashes back to India to spread them on the Ganges as, as, was, as per his request, and they said immediately, yes. Hmm. And she understood that when it was something personal, deeply, uh, something she needed deeply, uh, they would treat her like... Uh, you know, a state uh, entity, not as a person. If they had a pol political motive, which they did in allowing her to take Brezhnev Singh's ashes back, right? Because uh, they were they were engaged in arms sales with India, then they'd allow it. And I I had this image of Svetlana sitting on the plane, and instead of the man sitting beside her, sitting beside her is the urn. Wow. And behind her is her keeper. Right. I think. Uh, oh. What's fascinating is that a lot of what you just said comes through in that book, namely this idea of, of her heartbreak, but this almost, not that she was a dual personality, but, but when Svetlana's um, mother died, she didn't know why at first. She didn't know just who her father was until later. There was this kind of unveiling of who she was and how she related to the world that comes through so powerfully in the book and that she never completely reconciled with. And those images that you started with, I think, come through to us as the reader. And I wonder, uh, you know, this gets to a question for you as a biographer. T to what extent is this something that you have to work at and try and think about and reason out? And to what extent is this process instinctive and emotional and, and you know, just kind of flows out from those images? I think it's the latter, actually. I don't think, I don't, I mean, the the what makes biography on the one hand, wonderful to write, is there's a beginning and a middle and an end. <laughs> I mean, people have tried to screw it around and, you know, start with the sure. death or uh, start in the middle. Or films keep, obviously know. do yeah. that almost all yeah. the time with biography. Yeah. 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 But uh, in, in uh, and, and what's also the case is in every biography I've written, there's an opening scene, the preface, as it were, where the seminal moment is... Um, starts the book. So with Svetlana, it's when she's defecting in India, and uh, the uh, the uh, consul, George Huey, says, uh, uh, you say you're Stalin's daughter. The Stalin? <laughs> <laughs> I just love that moment. <laughs> People talk about me doing huge research, but it's endlessly entertaining. And... Uh, and there comes a moment when you won't, you don't need to do any more research because the pattern coheres. But how do you know when that is? Because that's a that's a skill for any writer. Is how do you know when to stop researching and start writing? Maybe you're tired. <laughs> 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 no, um, I go chapter at a time, one after the other after the other, uh, and um, I always do at least a year's research before I start the process of interviews, because. What makes it possible for you as a biographer to ask the most intimate questions of people is that they trust you. And the way they trust you is that you seem to, to know the story. You have, you know, you've done your work. So um, I think some, for some reason the um, excitement I can bring to a subject gets communicated and people seem to be remarkably candid and open. I mean... You know, when I started a biography of Svetlana's of Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, did it ever occur to me that I would go to Moscow to interview Stalin's grandson? Yeah. 
<laughs> and and uh, her cousins, who are the children of uh, her uh, mother's brothers, etc. Uh, but uh, again, something else happens, a uh, serendipity. Uh, the connect connections always occur. So I was in correspondence with a woman called Rosamond Richardson, who'd known Svetlana in London and written about a book about her, and it hadn't been the most um, positive experience for her. She had great admiration for, for Svetlana, but she managed to get on the wrong side of Svetlana by writing about Svetlana's father when Svetlana wanted her to write about her mother. Anyway, she writes me, and she says, I'm going to give you a hint. Check the Toronto phone book. <laughs> so mm. I go to the Toronto phone book, and here's here's uh, an Alleluyev. And so I phone this person, and uh, I say I'm writing a biography, and uh, she says, uh, we're not interested. Uh, Svetlana was promiscuous, we're not interested. Mm. And uh, so then I sent her a copy of my Villa Air Bell book, and she phones me, and she says, I'll see you. <laughs> 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 and then she says, and my father will see you. Her father was, uh, the family is in Moscow. Right. So then I, I meet her father and mother in Moscow. They get me in touch with uh, uh, um, Vasily's son, and the whole network starts working. Wow. And it always happens that way. Yeah. And, and you can't predict that or make it. You just have to kind of follow your nose, I guess. Well, and I mean, I... I, I uh, <laughs> I think you should be very careful if I say I'm going to write your biography. <laughs> because <laughs> when I was working on Villa Air Bell, I had this idea I was going to be writing the biography of a house. A right. house that was a place of refuge for uh, refugees who were coming from um, um, Eastern Europe or who were artists like, um, who were artists uh, under threat in France. Uh, and... Uh, so the person to contact was uh, the son of Victor Serge, because uh, most of these people were gone. Uh, the f one of the things you do is you always write the CIA, right? Really? Yeah, yeah. You write the CIA and the FBI, and you ask for their files. Uh, and because of the uh, Freedom of Information uh, clause, um, they have to give them to you or give you an explanation of why they're not giving them to you. And you can do that as a Canadian. Anybody can do it. It doesn't matter. It. Okay. No. Yeah. And uh, you can't do that same thing in Canada, inspect to get files, but you can in the States, as long as you can prove the person's dead and you can provide an obituary. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to remember the, my point of departure, but this segue is amusing. When I was writing about Elizabeth Smart, I thought, her, her um, by Grand Central Station, describes uh, how they get arrested at the Arizona border. Well, there's no Arizona border. You don't get arrested at the Arizona border. The FBI must have been following them, right? So I wrote to the FBI and said, I'd like the um, files you have on Elizabeth Smart. And they wrote back and said, uh, we have files on Elizabeth Smart, but we can't release them in the name of national security. <laughs> wow. Well, Elizabeth Smart is the most apolitical creature in the world, right? Yeah. In inconceivable. So then you can write back and say you need an explanation. Right. So then I write back and they say because she was cross-referenced with someone who is still an issue uh, of national security. So what would it be about? Probably somebody from the Spanish Civil War was on the West Coast at that writer's colony when Elizabeth was there. And who's still alive today. No. Uh, like, they, but why would it? Yeah. yeah because uh, he, he th there was a politics of anarchism or something. I mean, huh. you know, I, if you if you ask for the, all their files on bin Laden, I don't think you'd get them all. Right, right, right of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, the, at the same time, I think they were also watching George Barker because he had been in, in Japan and then he'd left Japan and come to anyway. So it's very wow. it's very amusing to to I find that endlessly fascinating. No kidding. That that's a story in and of itself. Yeah. Of how these stories are found, let alone written and 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 the story originally. Um, do you find there's a there's a difference between writing about someone who's uh, dead versus someone who's alive still? I've only didn't written about one person who was alive, and that was Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it's totally different. 
I had a motive in writing about uh, Margaret Atwood, which was, I went to see her and I said, I'd like to write a, uh, a book about you. And she said, I'm not dead. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'm writing a not biography about you, okay? <laughs> right. And she said, well, if it's good, the kudos is yours. If it's bad, the brickbats will be mine. Okay. And I didn't get any brickbats, so I guess it was okay. But I wanted to see how she found that level of confidence that, you know, she could, um, with such single-mindedness, pursue a writing career at a time when other writers didn't find, other women writers didn't have that confidence. But and one of the first things she did was hire a business manager, right? Oh, really? <laughs> well, or an assistant. Let's call it an assistant, mm -hmm. yeah. which every writer needs. There's um, Well, there's a parallel, I think, between you and, and Margaret Atwood, obviously. I mean, the both the fact that you're independent women, but there's, there's an interesting story about... Um, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but how you became a feminist when you were the runner-up for the Miss McGill <laughs> right. and you threw away the Barbie doll that you got as, con at a, as a consolation prize. And that's when you knew you followed that feminist path from that point forward. Yeah, it's a, it's a true story, actually. I don't know. I was working for Radio McGill and uh, there were two young guys who were running it and I was, you know, joined. And we went to visit the Beach Boys uh, and interview them at, a, at their concert. And those two guys got in and I was... A state outside with the luggage or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. But they had convinced me to run for Miss McGill. And I thought, uh, so I did because I was uh, accommodating and insecure, as you always are in your first year of university, right? And, but when I got the Barbie doll, I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't say I'm a feminist, but I was certainly not going to play that game anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that the strength has continued from, from that point forward. Um, I was going to tell you why I shouldn't write your biography. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, and uh, because as I was writing about um, Villa Arbel, the one person to uh, to um, meet who still would have memories was uh, Vladi Serge, Victor Serge's son. And it was Victor Serge who moved me. So wonderful a man. Uh, and uh, so my husband and I went, flew to Mexico, to Cuernavaca, phoned, and they said, he's not here. And I thought, okay, another book. Let's try something else. And then Juan phoned. Uh, and um, with his Chilean Spanish, which is admired throughout Latin America, right. wanted, you know, is, is he going to be all right? Apparently, he'd had a heart attack and was, <laughs> was on his way to the hospital. Oh. And, and he left me papers and stuff like that, but I never did get a chance to see him, and that was not the only time that occurred. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, there's so many stories about the creating and the, and the finding of these stories. It's a fascinating life. I mean, you've, you've been everywhere. You, you, you know, not just Czechoslovakia and Russia, but you've actually done a lot of work with Amnesty International as well. Mm -hmm. um, and do you, I mean, when you, when you think about, we, you know, we talked about air travel and the, the dilemma of that. But how much of your work do you feel you need to be in one place to kind of grapple with it versus having to go chase these things? Like, is there a, you know, is, is there a dilemma there? Because some people, you can chase something forever and never find it. Uh, but at the same time, if you never leave your room, you're never finding those clues that you need. How, how do you balance that? Uh, because I've always written about writers. So uh, there's going to be documents. Right. Yeah, I can go to... Uh, um, I'm sorry, everything seems to be a story when you're writing biography. I wanted to uh, um, to research the NARA files, the State Department files. And so it's just too hard to do it if you're not experienced. So I uh, went and I got the list of their researchers. And uh, their researchers, the most expensive one, was a guy called Sim Smiley. And I thought that's a perfect name for a researcher. <laughs> so, Smiley, like yeah. the um, like the Graham uh, Greene character, uh, or is it John Le Carre? Is it Graham Greene oh, or John Le Carre? I, I think it's John Le Carre. Yeah, 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 yeah. from uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, and other books. Yeah, and so Sim turns out to be a woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I eventually flew down to uh, to um, uh, Washington to meet her, and uh, it was very interesting because it was a, I mean, all these stories cohere. Uh, it was at the time when um, the Hillary Clinton issues of her emails, you know, being hacked and stuff like that, uh, the whole uh, of the, the employees of the State Department were brought in one by one and told that their files had been hacked and they were going to be given three years of insurance to protect their banks, their this, their that. And you wow. think, you know, 
there, there, this pretense that somehow, you know, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton hadn't secured her email or something, you know, she was lucky she was using private email because it was very, a very bad time. Anyway. Wow. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's funny. I think when we when we read a good biography, we're swept away by the story, but we forget the research that's necessary to build that and to build the structure of it, uh, and to and then the, the focus that's paid attention to the the reality of the person's life, not just the feeling of it. Mm. Um, but bo- both go hand in hand. And as you say, you follow your nose and, and you get there. Um, Rosemary, if there was, um, you know, we're approaching the end. If there was one thing that we haven't talked about that you wish we had. And if we had another hour to dig into this, <laughs> you'd want to address, what would that one thing be? Um, maybe again about Svetlana. Uh, as she was a child, uh, when her mother died, uh, uh, committed suicide when she was six and a half, and she didn't know it. But her father moved. And, you know, the thing about Stalin was he was a Georgian. I mean, a real patriarch, right? And um, paranoid and killing anybody who got in his way. There's nothing, you know, when people want to compare Hitler and and Stalin, I think it's just different tyrannies, different totalitarianisms. But here was, uh, he moves into a different uh, building in the Kremlin, and Svetlana, as a child, sits at the table from the age of 7 to 14. And it's Khrushchev and all the boys, Beria, are sitting around uh, unguarded, having conversations about... You know the, the police, the this, the that, the the politics, the um, and uh, and she's sitting there absorbing it all, and that's why she had such a brilliant political sense. Mm. And um, when she, my book was translated into Chinese uh, by a wonderful um, person I didn't meet, but uh, whose name was Kuang Ping, and uh, he would send me letters asking me to explain metaphors. It was beautiful piece of translation work, I assume, since I can't read it. Uh, and uh, it didn't get past the censors. Really? Yeah, it was killed. What, why do you think that was? I can only offer a hypothesis, which is that the portrait of Svetlana's, Svetlana's portrait of Putin would have been too right. risky for <laughs> the Chinese to, uh, uh, to support uh, because there is that moment at, towards the end of the book where she's writing her friend uh, in uh, the Lake District, Mary Burkett, saying, um, I can't believe that Russians will elect a man who will have a parallel system of government like had, had been the case in my father's time, a secret service. Right. And uh, she warned friends not to go to Russia, etc. So her politics was, was extraordinarily prescient. And uh, um, I think that's that's an, another part of of her story that's important. One thing that her story illuminates is is the absurdity of that era in Russia, which may still be absurd today. Um, there are certain aspects of it, anyways. But I mean, have you seen the film uh, "The Death of Stalin"? I loved it. <laughs> I mean, you know what's? It's a hilarious movie, and and especially if you know about the history of it, there have been some writers who have seen that movie and got this and said this is ridiculous, no. and, <laughs> and it's just a big satire. These things happened. The stuff that is in that movie is it really happened? And um, and Svetlana is a character in that movie. Um, she's the, she, they don't do do her justice. I didn't. Th- just I a, thought you would say pale, that. Yeah, she's just a pale uh, phantom. But the idea that uh, Beria uh, was arrested in the summer and probably killed. In December, wasn't he? No, he was arrested and, and killed in the summer and tried in December. Oh, he was killed before he was, oh. There's a theory. A oh, theory. Oh, so it's and possible that the film got it right then. Because that's one <laughs> no, aspect. No, uh, it would have been, it would have been several months I mean, uh, uh, Stalin died in March, right? And yeah. so it, it was the summer by the, before uh, Khrushchev outmaneuvered Beria. Right. But so the, he was arrested in the summer. Some historians believe that he was executed in the summer, but then tried, tried in, in December. Tried in December, in absentia, yeah. <laughs> in absentia. Well, I guess not in absentia. What would that be like? Uh, <laughs> there's another word for it, I assume. Behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but and and the the stuff that's funny in that movie is be, is funnier because it's true, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, and and part of what your book is illuminates is that. But of course, it illuminates so much more. Well, I'll um, tell you one last anecdote yeah. before we go. Okay, um, when I decided that I was ready to go to uh, the Soviet U- to Russia 
to um, interview uh, the family uh, whom I'd contacted beforehand. I was told never to go to Russia without a man. So I asked my husband to come with me. So my husband, myself, and I had two researchers who came with me. Wonderful young woman, Anastasia Kostryakova, and the other, Elena Romanova. And uh, we went to St. Petersburg, uh, and one who looks Spanish, Latin American, could see the racism that was directed towards him that, because uh, it was assumed probably that he was Arab or something like that. But anyway, it, it's a beautiful city, and we did go to uh, see where uh, the building where Putin had been mayor and all that. Then we went to overnight, took the train, which was great fun, to Moscow. I had rented an Airbnb um, through the uh, internet, and um, it was a two-bedroom Airbnb. So the the um, the landlord met us and took us through, and it turned out that the bed had been photographed with two different bedspreads. So it was a one-bedroom Airbnb. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we yeah. were accommodating. He spoke he spoke very good English. He used to work for the circus, like a Cirque du Soleil style thing. Anyway, uh, then he he got an air mattress for uh, Elena and uh, Anastasia slept on the couch. Fourth night, we get a phone call at midnight. It's the landlord saying that somebody needs to get into the apartment. Uh, so I look around to see if there's you know flooding or whatever, and I said nobody's getting into this apartment at midnight. The landlord phones back and he says, "Well, I'm afraid it's the police that need to get into the apartment." So. <laughs> We look at each other uh, and think, well, this is it a home invasion? Is this what's going on? So uh, Anastasia, uh, no, Elena, who's take charge, Elena, decides she's going to go downstairs and wait for the landlord. And we're looking at each other, Juan, Anastasia, and me, and we say, mm -hmm. we go downstairs too. So we wait. The landlord arrives, and he explains that, well, the police are coming with the suspect, because they want to interrogate her in situ about the murder that occurred in the apartment three months before. <laughs> <laughs> in the one you're staying in, yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> we, we, <laughs> it's midnight. We wait till three, three in the morning. And finally, this little, what seems to be a small car uh, pulls up and at least six big meaty detectives and a suspect, a woman, uh, climb out of the car. And uh, the detective comes up to me. The landlord has explained that the man who rented the apartment before us, three months before us, um, had gone to the Arbat, which is like Yorkville, and um, picked up a woman, brought her back, and she'd spiked his drinks. And uh, as the landlord put it, he had a bad reaction. He was found dead the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> so lead detective <laughs> Lermontov comes up to me, and he says, so sorry for the lateness of the hour. I'm lead detective Lermontov, and I say, not a problem. I'm Rosemary. And the guys behind, the cops, are laughing. And they're saying, I, I said to uh, Elena, what are they saying? She's always oh, copy me. What are they saying, Elena? They're saying, in the old days, we didn't need to apologize. Oh, my God. <laughs> how about... How about at one point, we didn't have to do this at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what? We always did it at 3 in the morning. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I know. That's just, that's just wow. Um, I, I imagine that there were times at which it just felt, um, I don't know if surreal is the right word, but to be, to be researching this in Russia, which you were talking about, which in some ways had changed, but in many ways had not changed. Well, I did ask somebody in, uh, whom I met in St. Petersburg. I said... Uh, is there some curiosity about me uh, researching Svetlana? And she said, no, nobody's interested in Stalin's daughter. So I, co I felt completely safe. Okay. It could have been anybody in that apartment where somebody was murdered. Sure. Yeah. So the landlord said to me, uh, can I do anything for you? And I said, yeah, get me another apartment. <laughs> 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 and he didn't have another one, so we stayed with the ghost. <laughs> wow. Um, that's fascinating. And a great place to uh, leave us off. Rosemary, thank you so much for taking the time. Pleasure. To learn more about Rosemary Sullivan, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes, as well as a way to get in touch with me. Let me know what you think of this episode or any other. You can find the show notes for this episode, and you can sign up for the newsletter. Every time I release an episode, I also release a newsletter going behind the scenes of that episode, talking about one of the aspects of it, or getting to know the guest in my conversation a little bit better. Now, your quote of the week is from Virginia Woolf. 
who says almost any biographer, if he respects facts, can give us much more than another fact to add to our collection. He can give us the creative fact, the fertile fact, the fact that suggests and engenders. Thanks, as always, to our composer, Andrea Wettstein, for providing this wonderful music. And special thanks for this episode to Rosemary Sullivan, who allowed us to record it in her home in Toronto. Coming up on the podcast, we're talking with David Meslin, activist, community organizer, and author based in Toronto. I'll see you then. Music